morning. It is just about time to begin our uh, uh, services here at Bobby Branch Church of Christ. We would like to take just a moment to extend a very special welcome to everyone here, uh, but especially any visitors that are here with us this morning. We want to extend a special welcome to you and invite you to worship with us at every opportunity that you have. Uh, we uh, worship every morning, every Sunday morning at 9 a.m., followed by Bible class at 10.15. It's over promptly at 11, and then we have Sunday evening services at 6 p.m., and then we also meet for our midweek Bible study uh, Wednesday night at 7. If you would like to go ahead and take out your Bibles and mark the scripture reading for this morning. This morning's scripture will be Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. That's Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. I do have several still on the sick list, but I do have some... Uh, a uh, few folks are here to be are here with us this morning, so we're, we're glad to announce that. Um, Stanley and number 438 number 438 and if you would please stand <clears throat> my, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood
Shall we pray together? Our most kind and loving, gracious and caring Heavenly Father, we come to you this day with humility of heart and humblest of spirit, thanking you for the blessings that come our way each day. We thank you for your love, your care, your providence that allows life to be as, as, as good as it is upon the planet that you created. And we're thankful, Father, for the physical blessings of life, the rain, the sunshine, the things that sustain life, make the grass grow, make the beauty spring forth as, it, as we near that time of year. And Father, we know that you're in control of all things. We're thankful for your wisdom and your caring, your, your providence that guides the very world in which we live, allows nature to do the things that make the planet be as it is. We're also thankful, Father, for the spiritual blessings that come our way each day. For this group of those who assemble here, who come together because we love you and we understand the precepts of your word. We understand that your way is the only way that can lead to eternal life. We're thankful, Father, that you gave us that standard by which we should measure ourselves and all people should measure themselves. We're thankful that it is a non-wavering, permanent standard. We pray that we would compare ourselves each day to the things that we should do. Look at the things we should not do and, Father, try to be more Christ-like. Try to be pure in the life that we live. And so that we may achieve that, we pray this morning for forgiveness of our sin. For we know that from time to time that we commit sins or we omit to do things that you've commanded us to do. And Father, with a penitent heart, help us to regret those things. Help us to turn away from them. Help us to help others understand that the things we might have done are not the correct way. And help us to be that light that is set upon a hill. Help us to be tender of heart towards those who might have wronged us, forgiving them as you forgive us. Our list is long of those who are undergoing the maladies of life, who because of the frailness of our bodies are suffering those things that have come upon them. We pray for the caregivers. We pray for those that minister to them to try and make them well. Give each of them a love, a care, a compassion for those that are suffering. Help us as Christians to care for them, to reach out to them, to support them, to give comfort, aid, and care. And Father, as they go through this, we pray that the things will be done that will bring their life back to uh, to a place where it should be. We're also mindful of those who have lost loved ones, those that they love so dear. But help us to remember that life is short and eternity has no end. And that as we go through life and we live the Christian way, that we have the promise and the hope of seeing those loved ones again. We long for that day. We look forward to that day when we can be with them, we can be with Christ, we can be with you. And we can live eternally. Thank you for the country in which we live, the strength that we have. But we also know, Father, that our country has departed seemingly from the ways you would have us go. But we also understand that there is the remnant of Christians who stand and will stand and should stand for the right. Help us to try to convince those that lead us to do the things that are right. Help us to do that by speaking out in an appropriate way by living in a way that we can, without doubt, say to them, the things you're doing are not the way you should do them. 
and this is the way they should be done. Thank you for the leadership of our church, for our elders who work together, who strive diligently to help us to maintain that way and stay in the way so that heaven can be our home. Thank you for our young people, those who serve as examples to those that they are in school with, their friends, their companions. Make them strong in your service, Father. For we know that young and tender hearts can be swayed at a moment's notice. Help us to support them. Help us to guide them. Help us to let them understand that there are those who have been through the same things that they have are enduring and that we can offer advice and counsel. May we do that with care and compassion. Be with those that protect us, whether in the military, the police force, the fire, the EMTs, and anyone who works in a field that puts them in danger from time to time. Bless them, protect them, help us to be supportive of them, and let them know that we do appreciate their service. Be with us this day as we continue to worship you. We pray, Father, that the songs on our lips would be acceptable in thy sight, that the meditations of our heart and the thoughts of our mind would be in the heavenly ways, for we know that that is what you have commanded us to do. This prayer we ask in Christ's most holy name, and amen. amen. Number 495, 495. Oh, the depths and the riches of God's saving grace. plates are placed in the back and also up front for your opportunity in supporting the work of the church by giving of your means. And with those regards, let's uh, offer a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you are loving, that you are kind and you are gracious, and that you bless us. And we know that in every way that we are blessed, it is by your hand. And Father, we're thankful that you 
Bless us in a way that we are able to prosper. And Father, help us to have gladness this day that we can support the work of the church, that we can show our love for the church by giving of our means this day. And Father, we pray for those who will see its use in the kingdom. We pray that you would help each of us to engage in the work that we may strengthen our faith, that we may encourage the brotherhood, that we may bring souls into your kingdom, and that we may glorify your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're using a songbook and would like to mark the invitation song, that'll be number 337. Number 337. And now before we um, have the Lord suffer and remember Jesus' death on the cross, we'll sing number 742. 742. When I serve John records Jesus being with his disciples and Jesus knowing that he soon will depart from them and telling them as such. Jesus wanting to, to comfort his disciples, he spoke this in John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. Uh, and, and, um, and not only this, but Jesus said that if, if I go and I prepare this place, I will come again, and that I'm going to receive you unto me, that you will be in this same place that I am. Um, what, what great hope, what great glory awaits us. And so we think of the cross, and we do, as Paul instructed the early Christians to do, that in partaking of the Lord's Supper, the bread and, and the fruit of the vine, we show forth his death till he comes again. We declare the things that Jesus just spoke to his disciples to comfort them. So we look at the, the cross with great, um, with great uh, gratitude, knowing what was given for us, but not just the gratitude, knowing the hope that awaits us, that dwelling place with Jesus in heaven in his Father's house. If you would, as we prepare to take the bread, would you pray with me? Almighty God, we are so thankful that by your hand you have provided for us salvation through the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and through his blood. And Father, this morning we offer our thanks for this bread that represents that body that hung on the cross and help us to partake of it in a worthy manner. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us also give thanks for the cup. Merciful Father, we are thankful that through the blood of Jesus, we can have the remissions of our hands, of our sins. And Father, that we can have this hope that he spoke about and that we can have this anticipation of glory in living with you, knowing that our sins are taken away by his blood, by his sacrifice. And Father, we pray that you would help each of us that we can live our lives in such a way that we can look forward to his coming again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Always a privilege to be able to walk into the pulpit and be able to spend some time studying God's Word together. And we're so delighted that you are here this morning. And for those of you visiting with us, we thank you for coming. And we also encourage you to come and worship with us at any time. We also do have a number of people who watch online as well as the Ben Loman even later during the week. We're thankful that you're with us as well. We hope that the time we spend studying God's Word is profitable, it's encouraging, and it's also corrective in our lives. This morning, we're going to continue in our study of the Gospel account of Mark. Last Sunday morning, we spent some time studying about John Mark and about his role as a young man and as he served in God's kingdom and became very profitable and I am so thankful that we have Mark's account of the gospel. 
because Mark moves immediately from what he discussed last week with regards to John the Baptist and the preaching of the gospel to the beginning of the personal ministry of Jesus. And the word immediately is a key word that you will notice as we study through this wonderful account of the life of Christ. Now, the first thing that we're going to notice is the, after the baptism is the temptation of Christ. And temptation is a daily reality for us. And if you and I do not consider it important, in fact, if we ignore it, we then become the devil's prey. We read in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. It's almost like we have a, just a very aggressive and mean predator who's out there just waiting for us to become his next meal. Well, the devil is just like that. He's looking for us and placing before us temptations. And I will tell you, the study of the temptation of Christ is extremely valuable for us. Sometimes when we look at Jesus, we tend to think, well, he was the Lord. He had a life that was different than us. But I go to Hebrews chapter 4 in verses 17, or chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, and it says, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, and to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now listen carefully to verse 18. For in that he himself suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. The Lord is able to help us, aid us in the daily struggles that we have because I can look at him, I can look at the way he approached it, I can look at how he conquered it and realize I can do the same in my life. And then you go to chapter 4 and verse 15, and there we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Everything that you and I face, the Lord has faced as well. The difference is, I stumble and I fall, as well as you. But the Lord always chose the right path. He always resisted temptation. Now, with that in mind, I want us to study Mark chapter 1, and I want us to focus on the temptation of Christ. And I want us to look, first of all, at the timing of it. And that's important. Because the timing in which you and I face temptation is important. Second of all, I want us to look at the type versus the antitype. And that's a biblical feature. Then we're going to focus on the text for just a few minutes. And then finally, we'll end up with some truths to be studied. Let's begin, first of all, and if you will, I want to ask you to open your Bibles. If you don't have your own Bible with you, there's a pew Bible in front of you. And we're going to focus on Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 9 and going through verse 13, because this introduces the timing of what occurred. And Mark says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parted and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then the voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and the, was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. Now, the very first thing that I want you to notice is that Matthew and Mark and Luke all record this same event. And each of them are able to give us a little bit different perspective, but what Mark does is portray for us that this happened immediately after Jesus was baptized. Now, for us, 
I know sometimes we, we tend to think that this word immediately is not necessarily that significant, but it is. In this case, the timing was extremely important because this is right when the Lord was what we might say was on a spiritual high. One of the mountaintop points in his life. If I were to ask you in your own life, what time in your life do you, can you point back to and say, I can tell you that specific time that I was doing really well, and it was usually because a person had just become a New Testament Christian. They'd been baptized for the remission of their sins. I can remember my baptism vividly, even though it happened many, many years ago, and I would say most of you can as well. And you think about all the things that here Jesus has come from Nazareth. He's gone to John, the Baptist, this one we studied about last week. He goes to him to the Jordan, and though Mark doesn't focus on why the Lord did it to fulfill all righteousness, we'll talk later about baptism a little more specifically. But at this point, I want you to notice that Mark says immediately after that, God speaks from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God was pleased with what Jesus was doing. And then the Lord begins his personal ministry. But you see, it's a challenge right here at the very beginning. And if I were to ask you, do you believe that when you are on a spiritual high that you are invulnerable, that the devil can't do anything to you? Well, I'd suggest to you that's when you are the most vulnerable. For whenever a person thinks that he is not subject to the devil, he is not subject to temptation, that's when he is in the most dangerous position. Well, the devil seeks us when we are the most vulnerable. And that's what we have here is that when you're in a situation where you think everything's going good, everything's going right spiritually, that's when you have to be very careful because the devil can then throw a trap in front of you and you're not looking for it. You're not watching for it. What this does, this leads us into the next part of our lesson, which I think is perhaps the most significant part of it. And I'd like to talk to you for just a few minutes about types of, and antitypes. And it's a beautiful feature of Scripture. For instance, you go to the Old Testament and there is something that is a type, and in the New Testament you have an antitype, something that parallels it or answers it, if you will. When Peter is writing his first letter, he's talking about what occurred during the flood. And how God brought a flood on this earth and what it did, it washed away all of the sins that was on this earth. And in 1 Peter 3, verse 21, there's also an antitype which now saves us baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You look at the flood, what it did, it washed away the sins of that old wicked world. What does baptism do? It washes away the sins of a person's life. You can see the parallel between the two. And what I'd like to suggest to you is there is a parallel between the children of Israel as they came out of bondage in Egypt and went through the wilderness, and what Jesus did when he came out of Nazareth, baptized, and then went into the wilderness. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. It may seem almost insignificant. And there he was until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now notice out of Egypt. We think about Israel coming out of Egypt. Jesus coming out of Egypt. Well, let's look and see if we can see some parallels, if you will. Israel was tested after their baptism. 
you will, go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll look at verses 1 through 5 and then verses 11 through 13. Because that's where we're going to observe the parallel. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Just for a moment, look at that wonderful passage there. He says, they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. When they went through the the Red Sea, when the Lord parted the waters, that was a baptism. And then what happens when they come out on the other side? They're in the wilderness. But in the wilderness, God was not well pleased with most of them. Now, what was about Jesus after his baptism? God was well pleased with him. We just read about that. But then I keep reading, dropping down to verses 11 through 13. Now, all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. If you will notice here the the parallels, if you will, he said you look back at them and he says that becomes an example to us. And then verse 12 he says, For the person who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. The temptations that are going to come to you, you have to be very careful because if you're not careful, you'll fall with them. And then he says, that's something that's common to all of us. What happened to them and what happened to Jesus and what happens to us are all the same. But we have to realize that God always makes a way. He always prepares a good path you and I can follow and avoid sin. Now, if you think about what Israel went through, they endured 40 years in the wilderness. That parallels the 40 days in which Jesus was in the wilderness fasting during those 40 days. Their first test when they came out of the Egyptian bondage was that of food. And if you read with me Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, there Moses writes, And you shall remember the Lord your God led you all the way for these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to be hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might know what... Man, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That, that passage there is so powerful because you think about Jesus being led out into the wilderness. What is the very first thing that he is tempted to do? To turn stones to bread. And you remember how the Lord responds? He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That tells me that the Lord was using this passage to emphasize how that the testing was there, but yet God expected us to live not by bread alone. The second test was God's protection for them. If you go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16, there we read, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him at Massa. Now, if I keep reading, going back to the book of Exodus this time, to chapter 17, I learn about that. And it says, Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? Now, that's an important statement. Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why 
it, it, uh, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And so Moses said to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, also take in your hand the rod with which you struck the river, and go, and behold, I will stand before you on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and they called on the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, now here's the phrase, is the Lord among us or not? The second temptation for them is they had to decide whether or not the Lord was among them or not. And when they said the Lord is ta not taking care of us, they were tempting God. Do you remember the second temptation that Jesus endured? How that the devil took him to the pinnacle of the temple, said, cast yourself off of it, for the, he will give his angels charge concerning you, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. And you remember how the Lord responded? You shall not tempt the Lord your God. The Lord is following a pathway with his temptations responding to the devil exactly the same way that Israel was tempted. But the Lord responds by saying no to the devil. Then the third temptation was if they would worship someone other than God. To go back to Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 4, now when the people saw that Moses delayed from coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For is this Moses, this man who brought us up from the land of Egypt? We do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off your golden earrings, which are in your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. And so all the people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned them with a graving tool and made a molded calf. That they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Do you remember the third temptation that Satan put before our Lord? Fall down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And how the Lord responded, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. What I understand is, is that there's a type and a type. There's a parallel, if you will, between what Israel went through and what our Lord went through. And we should expect that same kind of thing in our own lives. Do you remember John when he wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but of the world. The world is passing away in its lust, but he who does the will of God abides forever. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, those three avenues used on Eve in the Garden of Eden, used on the children of Israel coming out of the wilderness into the wilderness, used on our Lord as he was led out into the wilderness, and used on us as the devil seeks to tempt each and every one of us. Now, for just a few minutes, let's focus on the text that is there. We've already read the text in verses 9 through 13, but the first thing you will notice after the Lord's baptism, he was driven into the wilderness. I love studying the original words because sometimes they just really are such colorful and meaningful terms. The word driven here is the same word for casting out demons. Literally, he was cast out into the wilderness right after his baptism. And there he was driven by the Spirit. His devotion, his obedience must be proved. We learn from the Hebrew writer that though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. 
And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. We understand that many times when we read texts like this, that the Spirit sometimes allows us to be tempted and to be in the wilderness. Second of all, it says he was in the wilderness with wild beasts. The word wilderness refers to an uninhabited place. Sometimes it was what we would call desert. Other times it's just where people did not live. And while the Lord was there, it appears that he didn't have anyone with him. He's out there by himself. And Mark tells us there's also wild beast. Temptations often come with additional challenges. We'll often feel like we're by ourselves. We'll often have other difficulties that will come at us at the same time. And that's the way the level, devil loves to do it. He loves to put us under pressure. In fact, many times, multiple pressures. But the third thing that you will notice in this context is it says every temptation until an opportune time. Listen as Luke records this in Luke 4, verse 13. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. That's the way the devil operates. He just looks for opportunities in our lives. He looks at us when we are at the very pinnacle and everything seems to be going well and we are not looking for the devil to place a temptation in front of us. And he also hits us when we're at our very bottom, when we're weak and we're going through difficulties and we're going through terrible times. But it says that the angels ministered to him. That means the Lord took care of, God the Father took care of our Lord. And we need to understand that when we're going through temptations, we can also go to God and ask for his help. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, In nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. When we find ourselves suffering the temptations of the world, the greatest avenue that we have is to be able to approach God and know that he will always hear while we're going through our times of difficulty. Now let's talk about for just a few minutes some truths that follow from this. Temptations will come to everyone. There was an old preacher of many years ago, not a member of the Lord's church, but an old preacher who had some wise observations. He said, God had one son without sin but he had no son without temptation. And that means that everyone who is a child of God is going to endure temptation, including Jesus. He also said later on, the devil looks for opportunities for weakness. And here's the quote. Many a man thinks himself a Joseph, and the only reason why is that no Potiphar's wife has tried him. Many a man has never been an Achan, because no wedge of gold or goodly Babylonian garment has come his way. And what he says, we look at people in the Bible and we may think we're as strong as Joseph, but we've not ever been really tested in that area. Or we may think we would not give in to temptation like Achan did, but perhaps no wedge of gold, no good garment has been put in front of us. We have to realize whether it's at a high or at a low, we have to avoid temptation. Now, the devil comes at us from numerous directions. He looks for our weak spots. It may be when we're hungry. It may be when we are in doubt. It may be when we have religious questions and devotions that are in our hearts. And we're beginning to ask questions. Well, is the Lord going to take care of me? Is the Lord going to provide for my needs? The devil would love for us to give in at the moment of our weakness. But there's always value in going to God for help. Listen to Matthew 6 and verse 13. When the Lord gave the model prayer, the disciples had asked him to teach them to pray. He said, you pray and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
do not lead us into temptation. You know, if you're studying Matthew's account, you have Matthew 4, then you have Matthew 5, the great Sermon on the Mount. And it is in that first part, that great Sermon on the Mount, while you still think of the temptation of Christ, that he said to pray, lead us not into temptation. I think he has to still be thinking about what occurred while he was in the wilderness. To pray, I don't want to go through a time of temptation. Deliver me from the evil one. He said, that's what you ought to pray. When I get to Luke 22, verses 40 and 46, the Lord is with Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he's going to be arrested, tried, and then crucified. And I read there, he tells them, and when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter to temptation. Men, you need to pray while you're here that you won't be tempted. Verse 46, and he said to them, why do you sleep? Arise and pray lest you enter into temptation. What took place right after that? The Lord was arrested, and what did his disciples do? They fled from him. You see, they gave in to the temptation. Perhaps had they been spending that time in prayer and asking God not to lead them into temptation, but to deliver them from the evil one, perhaps they would not have given in. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13 again, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. God will not allow you to have a temptation stronger than you can resist. And God also will make a way of escape that you can bear it. Every time I find myself in a temptation, there's always a right way to handle it. And I've got to seek it out. I've got to look for it. But we have to realize we can defeat the devil. Yes, he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But we can stand up against Satan. If you read Psalm 119, verse 11, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word I've hidden in my heart. If I've got God's word in my heart, I know how to respond to the devil because that's the way the Lord did. It is written, and that's the way he responded to the devil. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, he told him to put on the whole armor of God, and he says, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You take the shield of faith and you will be able to encounter the devil and your faith will shield you from that. And then verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You can use God's word to be able to confront it. In Luke chapter 8, the Lord's parable of the soils. And he says, the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. They're thrilled with it. And these have no root, who believe for a while, and in a time of temptation fall away. I can't tell you how many times I have observed the parable of the soils and the parable on the stony ground or the rocky ground take place in the life of real people. Someone is baptized for the remission of their sins. They come up out of the water excited and ready to slay the devil, only to see them fall away when difficulties come their way. The Lord endured temptation, and he is our example in all things, but he is greatly our example in how to deal with temptation. And we read in James 1 and verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. What are we supposed to do when we are facing temptation? We're supposed to resist it. We are supposed to endure it. 
We're supposed to come out on the other side, and the man who's been approved gets the crown of life. And then James 4, verse 7, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit to God. This morning, that's what we're going to encourage you to do, is to submit to God. When God tells you what you need to do is to believe that Jesus Christ is his son, we read that in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, John 8 and verse 24. When we are to repent of the sins we have committed, we're to say, I'm sorry to God for what I've done, and I want to change my life. That's Luke 13, verse 3, verse 5, Acts 17, verse 30. And then to confess our faith in him, to say to others, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, and then to be baptized, just like Jesus was, for the remission of our sins. His was to fulfill all righteousness, but everybody else's is for the remission of sins. And having done so, the Lord will add us to his body, the church, and our sins are washed away. That's submit to God. And then you resist the devil as he comes to you. He'll flee from you. We're going to sing the song of encouragement. Is thy heart right with God? And only you can answer that question. And if your heart is not right, we want to urge you to respond as together we stand and sing. <laughs> again we have a good crowd this morning and we want to know that we thank everyone for your attendance and if you're visiting with us we especially thank you if you are visiting with us and uh, you're new in our area or looking for a congregation to be a part of to regularly worship with please see uh, talk to some of the eldership and we would love to have you here to be a part of this good congregation at Bobby Branch We'll have Bible classes that will start in just a few minutes, and they'll be over with at 11 o'clock, and then we'll be back this evening for our evening service. I want to say thank you to Tony for that good lesson this morning. It helps to know that we all are tempted, just like Jesus was. Being tempted is, uh, is not a sin, but whenever you give in to that temptation, that's what we have the trouble. And I also thought, Tony, about uh, this week was the week of the Freed Hardeman Lectureships, and it did not snow. 
We should have known that it wasn't going to snow because the groundhog has already told us that the winter is over with. But uh, that's something that we always look forward to, the week of Freed Hardeman, because it usually does come some kind of a little ice or snow or something of that nature. But thank you once again for being here, and remember to be back this evening for our evening worship. Now, Brother Seth is going to lead us in a closing hymn, and we, we, we will be dismissed with a prayer. For 400. I care not to say so thankful to have had this time to come together and to worship in your in your name with like-minded Christians we're so grateful that you have preserved your word through time that we can have a way to know what would be in what would be right for you and father we pray that through this day and through this week we will continue to have an attitude of thankfulness toward you for your creation your power for our lives, for our salvation in your Son. And Father, we pray that through this week you'll hold us in the hollow of your hand, you'll guard us and protect us and bring us back together again. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen.